Ladies and gentlemen, I hope to be able to give you some views into artificial intelligence and in different parts in relation to our lives, human lives and human societies. And let's think about what about us humans. I don't start to explain my human existence here because we all are valuable and just what happened to me is not much more important or at all more important what happened has happened to you and that's why we would more likely to have a situation that we could share actually our experiences about our lives and put it together and understand together something more. There are a couple of reasons why I anyway edit this kind of live CV, but I don't intend to go through it or anything. You can read some of the details. There may be some keywords, make some, some kind of ideas about this. But uh, the, the, I have let a couple of lines uh, away because of the, of the things I want to give in some order. Another uh, idea about life and the kind of one's own life is that I have been oriented to my data, our data, and also uh, quantified self for all of my life, more, uh, more or less. So already when I was 10 years old, so I was very happy to be a statistician who was writing down what happened in the world and around us including my friends being kind of doing some athletic things and then the results were kind of written down by myself and that has been continuing in various ways. Unfortunately, the community wasn't there around these things and the computational tools and so on were there. So I'm actually very happy towards the children and so on and the younger generations who can be enjoying all the possibilities that the computational tools and network give, gives us to us. Uh, and then if we think about also this openness, so I've been very keen on using Linux and all the open source uh, opportunities that we have in the world. And uh, I can say that I've been a computer science uh, professional since the 80s, started my studies in 81, and I have actually, strictly speaking, I have never used Windows, which I think uh, almost nobody can say the same. I have been using just Linux and occasionally some Apple kind of things, but not actually really Windows. Uh, I don't know what to boast with it, but anyway, I think it's a kind of interesting coincidence that something like this can happen. But let's go into the matters themselves. So I would like to have a warm-up uh, minute so that I wrote some questions that are meant to make to you to kind of start to think through the matters in a more, let's say, philosophical way or go going through these important things that we are dealing with in this conference. Again, I'm not reading word by word what is there, and that's why I rather suggest that you have a chance to go through these uh, questions by yourself. Actually, there's also another reason why I'm not reading them to you. Namely, I'm blind. Luckily, not fully blind, but I'm semi-blind, so half of my uh, visual scene is missing. So when I'm looking you here, so I don't see anything here. And so I need to watch there so that to see you really, but then, of course, it's a bit difficult to see there. So that's why I'm actually, I'm also uh, slow in reading. And that's why I think uh, speech technology, natural language processing, all these parts of AI, I'm very happy to live now because I couldn't do my work without these tools that we have in the mobile phones and so on. So I'm speaking to the machine. I wrote a book by 
uh, telling things to the machine and it was then sending it to the network and uh, sending back the written texts and so on. So that's the way I've been, I'm working uh, nowadays. So the result of that process was a bo this book called The Peace Machine. And the idea was that if a person comes to a situation where he notices that the life ends at some stage, so what should I do at such a situation when one has been studying, for example, AI for more than 30 years? So there must be something that could be reached with all these things that we have available. Not just make the companies to be more profitable and not to lay off people because there are more and more things that can be used in order to kind of make the machines to be more efficient than, than humans. This morning, actually, when I was coming here, I, w I took the train and I saw an accident where a big truck uh, uh, drove over a bicyclist. So this man, I thought that he must be dead because it was such a bang. I heard the bang and then I saw and all the 100 people, we looked at this situation. Luckily, we saw that this man started to sit and so on, but it looked very dramatically so that I hopefully he will be fine anyway. So there could be, of course, all kinds of injuries. But that, for example, means that my own thinking has been such that I suggested 15 years ago to EU Commission that EU should start to do serious work towards robotic cars. Because it seemed to me obvious that the million people that we lose every year in the world, that number of people, the casualties, will be going down dramatically. Uh, the, uh, it's all these kind of ideas that uh, circle around robotic cars mostly or very often they are quite narrow and so on. There are thoughts that there needs to be something that guides the cars and so on. But all the methodologies related to pattern recognition and these kind of possibilities to view the world from very many uh, perspectives uh, without the limitations that we humans have and all this anger and uh, alcoholism and all kinds of things that make us to be very op unoptimal as drivers means that actually in the long term we are not allowed to drive cars because we are not too good in doing it. Uh, there's actually uh, a bio uh, biological and uh, psychological view into this so that from the point of view of uh, genetics, we are not very well tuned to the world of cars because it has been pointed out that we are not, we are not afraid of cars in the way we should be because cars has been around for so short time. And that's why we are not kind of taking uh, the situation very carefully because we are more afraid of some kind of uh, living creatures which are not mostly uh, relevant in our kind of fear context here, for example, in Finland. But anyway, we are more afraid of some small thing uh, growing, uh, going there rather than some car which is approaching us. And that's not actually very wise, but that's the way how we are growing. The same, of course, concerns AI. But, for example, media makes it very uh, clear that we should be afraid of things and these developments are something that take our jobs and we are not able to uh, master those things, but we are kind of getting into uh, deep trouble with AI. But there are also other points of view, and my point of view of, of is here that if we only focus on negative things, we are actually, from the point of view of even anticipatory system uh, research, we are creating the negative future. So if we only pay attention to these kind of uh, our fears uh, towards these kind of developments, we are actually creating the future that we fear. And that's why I uh, 
came up with this idea that we have to really seriously consider also the positive uh, possibilities that we have. And that's actually so, then summarized in the concept of the peace machine. Uh, the peace machine has three areas. The first area where machines, AI and so on, can help us is related to communication using language. And some simple things are, for example, that we can translate things more and more efficiently. These, for example, multi-layer neural networks have been started or the kind of their use finally are being used. I started my area, uh, kind of career in neural network research in 19, early 1990s, uh, and there for years and years I was asking or hoping that the researchers would start to focus on these things rather than on so-called so uh, rule-based AI. It was already at that time, it was quite obvious that the rules as a basis for AI are not the right thing to do. And I will be discussing this thing more in detail. But anyway, we as humans, language is the basis for our existence in very many ways. And the way how we can use language is really central to us. And in addition to the multiplicity of languages, we also need to take into account that languages are such that they are not logical tools. Logic is one way of considering language, but that's quite uh, limited. And there are many other views which are, I would uh, dare to say, more important. And I will give you a couple, some insights into that. If we want to make people more peaceful, we really need to take emotions seriously. For example, fear and anger are things that easily make us to behave in an in a, uh, unoptimal way, so to say. And it's quite uh, obvious that whether it's the Second World War and what happened in Germany and so on, raising the fears and anger are something which is too easy to do. So if you start to say that those people are, uh, we need to be afraid of those people because their ideas are so different and they look very different and whatever. So this kind of uh, manipulation of our thinking is really, I would dare to say unethical, but it's, not, uh, it's also unpractical. So from the point of view of functional human collaboration, we need to be able to manipulate in practice our own emotions, especially those emotions which are not relevant for the situation. Of course, we need to be, and we can't let us not to be emotional. That's our main characteristic, actually. We share that with animals and so on strongly, and it's the first thing that we experience when we have something, an experience of the life. But anyway, we can be wise with our emotions. And the I, one idea here is that we can use artificial intelligence to understand our emotions. Because the systems are not emotional themselves, but they can analyze and help us to be more wise with our own emotions. But this doesn't is, this is not enough. In order to be able to have more peaceful societies and the world to be more peaceful, we need to take into account that we are not ready at all. We can say that there are many things uh, such that we have unfair situations, we have uh, societies uh, such that the poor ones or those who are suffering they really don't have a proper chance to prosper in the life and to be happy and so on. So we are very far from happiness in the society. We have to consider what are the natures of uh, democracy and economy and so on. And 
this our community here is in a very important role in that. How do we build our society? How do we make it more democr uh, democratic in the sense that it's actually in the current world voting is such a small thing to do. If we vote every four years, every six years to have some representative for us, that's so uh, narrow channel that, that information, that understanding that we all have, that really doesn't flow into the decision making. And that needs to be changed. And that can be changed thanks to the technologies that we start to have available. And that's the new, uh, the claim is here that we are uh, aiming or we can be aiming at new for forms of democracy. Not only having some more efficient ways of voting and so on. Voting will be outdated. We need to be able to have conversations about the contents and the contents that conversation among millions or billions of people can be helped and guided by the technologies we, that we start to have at hand. So, printing was very central innovation some 500 years ago or so. There was this first industrial revolution and now we have the next revolution. My claim is that the next 20 years we are having more change in the world of the human life than what has been happening during the past 2,000 years. I don't want to make hype or something, but I think it's just a thing to be taken seriously into account. I will discuss some aspects why this is the case and why and what are the positive factors that could be taken into account here in the long term. I start from very simple area domain. Sorry for those who practice chess and are keen on playing chess. As a child, I, my father taught me to play chess and we enjoyed. He was a man who had been in the Second World War, like his brother, and there was some kind of let's say, effects on that, but chess was a very happy thing because we shared some time in a nice way together. And that's why I, it was a very positive thing to me. Then I didn't continue it, but anyway, I understand what happens in chess. And I also know what happens in AI in its old form, rule-based AI, and what this happens now in this kind of machine learning and pattern recognition-based uh, AI. And I would like to use this as a starting point into the effect of AI on this kind of rich enough uh, phenomena. Chess is a simple domain, so it's very rule governed. The domain is very kind of uh, formally uh, definable. But anyway, it's rich enough that the human competence, intuition, creativity, and so on can be uh, shown there. And there is a long history of thousands of years. And there are kind of famous matches between genial players in the history. And in then 1997, there was this catastrophic moment for more, many that the best machine won the best human player in the world. And many took it very seriously. I edited a book on humans, games and machines or playing because I found it to be a little bit overstated 20 years ago that it would be so relevant for humans that this simple game of chess would be such that machines take over humans here. Now, 20 years later, we are actually in a very new situation. Now we are having relevant AI. And I would like to use this simple domain of chess as a kind of starting point into this change. This kind of multi-layer neural network system with this reinforcement learning was devised into the game of Go first. 
which is much more complex than, in, uh, than chess in some sense. So it was a first demonstration of the power of this kind of machine learning type of approach. But maybe chess is more familiar for many of us in Europe, European context. And what happened then that this, this team that had been uh, working on Go, Game of Go and made it to be better than the best human player, they tested last year that what happens with chess. And they, they used this methodology to train a chess machine to play in such a way that they just gave the rules of chess and then the machine started to play against itself. And it played four, hour, uh, four hours. And in four hours, it learned to be better chess player than any human, any best human player or the previous dull and brute force AI system that is just basically going through this search tree and then uh, it's kind of decision tree. Yesterday someone mentioned the word decision tree. Decision trees are, for example, very outdated in some sense because human understanding of complex phenomena are not the uh, decision trees are not the things to be used when we need to deal with complex phenomena. And there we come into uh, various aspects like communication and explanation, which I will be discussing soon. But this was a shock for many chess players. So it, some uh, people went into denial. This is not true, there's some trick, there's, this is not really true. Some people became really enthusiastic. Actually myself, I became enthusiastic because I know about chess enough that I understand when there's beauty, when there's creativity. And this Alpha Zero exposed creativity and beauty in such a way that I had never seen in life, in my life, the times I had been devoting in watching the kind of classical games which have been available. It was really surprising that this system was able to do things which were against all the principles that are, have been there for hundreds of years, that we have learned a culture of chess saying that this thing shouldn't be used because it typically leads into a bad solution. But this system is now able to view on the situation from such a point of view that we humans haven't been able to build it because we are using rules, we have, are using heuristics. We have limited cognitive capacity, even if it's large. And that's the situation. So in order to survive in the world, we make heuristics. And sometimes those heuristics are really catastrophic even. We Many people think that even if there is some UN uh, principles that we shouldn't take the gender or we shouldn't take the race or whatever as a guiding principle for modeling the world, many people still think that, oh, now I saw a person from Africa, there must be something now problematic or there's something else. Or there are people who say that women really can't learn to conduct a symphony orchestra or whatever. Or once as a professor I met a woman who had uh, stopped her studies because he had, she had been said by a male uh, teacher that this thing, this program that uh, you made for visual kind of some application can't be done by you because women can't program this way so well that it must be some man who has done this and then you have just claimed that this is your uh, work. I would have liked to go to that man and give some whatever. You can understand that I was quite angry but I was lucky that I could give a chance for her to pr uh, prosper and do things in a good way. But these heuristics, these rules, this logic that we have, we are surrounded by predicate logic. We are taught at school that logic is the basis for 
good reasoning. That's not true. And that's why we are coming into a situation where we need to even, those who know Daniel Kahneman, know that potentially he wasn't even, uh, it wasn't fair that he got the Nobel Prize because he has some flaws in his argumentation. And the problem that we are uh, entering into here is that we formalize the world in such a way that the formalized part of the world, the formalism works well, but then people play, take the playground, they choose the playground where they can manage to do things well, and then there's the whole world around it. And so that's why the complexity of the world has to be taken into account. And that's why, for example, computer science, I would dare to say, is still in its infancy. So the kind of the basis of computers is such that we need to still consider what do we want to do next to make more or make better computers that serve us in a good way, not to be such formalists that they are nowadays. These neural networks and so on are, of course, implemented within the framework of traditional computer science and computer technology, but that's quite inefficient. There have been many attempts over the decades to make new kinds of uh, computer architectures, but usually they have failed because this framework of digital computing is actually quite efficient because it's easy to program and so on. But I dare to say that there is a new kind of future to come during which, for example, programming will change. So we who can program and have done our living partly at least uh, on, or by programming we are not having the same situation 20 years from now because we will be in a situation in which we can say to a system, I would like to have a program that does this or that. So, and then this meta-level system will be able to actually program the system that the person wants to have. And that's the situation that is coming. So, but the, of course, the complexity of the world is much, it's huge compared with chess and the board and the complexities. There are some estimates that how many games can be played in chess. Most of them are not relevant, but anyway, the number of games is huge. But our real context, this world and ourselves, we as humans and our societies, it's still hugely much more complex. And many times we make a, a mistake that we think that natural sciences are the main starting point for all understanding and our skills of dealing with world. But we have to remember that natural sciences deal with quite simple things in the world. So, of course, there were important findings regarding stars and so on. What is the position of the Earth in relation to the Sun and other planets and so on? So that has been, of course, important part. All the uh, elements and, and so on are still relevant. I'm not claiming that we should somehow undermine natural sciences. But the challenge is that that's not enough we have to be even more analytical in such a way that when we consider living systems, biology, there are complexities that can't be modeled with the technologies and methodologies that have been made for natural sciences. And then, we, if we think about human lives and humans and human societies, they are, these phenomena are such that the natural sciences uh, don't have a means to tackle with things which are related to linguistics and biology and, uh, sorry, uh, psychology and, and history and so on. One reason is that if you have a, a physical phenomenon related to atoms or whatever, or what is the, ever is the scale, the phenomenon is not changed 
by what we are doing, it remains the same. It has been there always, the Big Bang or whatever. So there are theories, that's the theory that we have. But anyway, anything after that, the atoms are doing the same thing as they did for huge times of the history. But, for example, in psychology, if someone who is within psychology makes a finding about human and writes about it, and newspapers and TV and other media are uh, making available to us, that means that our behavior is actually changing, little or even sometimes potentially dramatically, through the finding of the researcher. That doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't happen. Uh, with uh, physics or chemistry or whatever, natural sciences. So that's why when people call for clear facts or rules that govern our behavior or language or whatever, that's actually quite, okay, I don't say the word that I wanted to say because I don't want to be disrespectful. But anyway, we have to take into account that there is a, complex systems there, where there are multiple layers, there is emergence, there are feedback, feed-forward mechanisms and so on. The statistics of those things are not governed by the statistics that we usually use. We can't abandon mathematics, but we need more mathematics. Mathematics is not something that exists in the world, regardless of us humans. Mathematics is a creation of ourselves, of those who have had the chance to be in a position to invent new things in, within mathematics. And that's, of course, the same within computer science and the tools that we have and the understanding. And in relation to humanities and social sciences, that's a huge task to deal with the things. So we are in the very starting position and that uh, also relates to the use of AI, because in order to create a better world, we need to have scientific understanding related especially to humanities and social sciences. But then we, of course, need strong understanding of the mathematical modeling and computational modeling, and that there is a lot to do. That's still, I would say, that it's in its infancy. So, when we are dealing with uh, these kind of phenomena, we need to consider the things I have listed in the lower part of the, this slide, so that I don't start to uh, read through that list, but the idea is anyway that in order to do things and influence our future, we need to take into account very many different kinds of things. May pick, pick up, for example, values and identities. If I take, let's say, Northern Ireland, the factual difference in opinion, if uh, what I understood there when I've been explained the situation there, which used to be, is minute, so there is really not really a kind of great difference in uh, the thinking, but then the identity that those are our enemies and my father was fighting and there was uh, this brother who was killed and so on. So we built these kind of models of reality and we simplify the world and we keep up situation through this kind of uh, uh, fixing the models in such a way that we keep up having these kind of problems. And that's, of course, not very easy to change because in order to make the change, we have to build trust. And that's one of the key things, that how are we able to do that. Here, in this kind of social situation, I implicitly trust you fully. So. If there would be some situation where there would be, for example, a political kind of argument or so on going on, that could be that there might be someone who had some evil uh, thoughts in mind. 
But anyway, so this kind of situation, how to, for example, I have an idea that how to build a trust among all the people in the world. That's a kind of fancy idea, but anyway, so I wish to suggest that the AI can be helping us not actually being able to understand anything, not to have any emotion, not to feel, and so on. It's a good fake thing, but it's uh, such a thing that it has a causal uh, influence on our lives because it can analyze, it can have these kind of things that make us to understand things in a different way, even if the machine is not actually living in a human way at all. And that's why humans are important. We are there to be considered very carefully. And for example, when I was criticizing at least slightly his thinking and work has been very important, but anyway, for example, he, I would dare to say, has made some mistakes in his reasoning, at least in the early stages, is related to the idea on the side there which puts together human thinking and decision making and problem solving so that the first system that deals with the world that we have is the emotional system so that we check that whether our experience is something that we need to be happy about the opportunity that we have to find some food or something or if there is some uh, uh, threatening thing that we have to react immediately. And in the current societies, as has been pointed out, there is often uh, extended stress that is bad for us because then we are kind of maybe fearful most of the time for weeks and months and so on. And that's of course very negative to our health then. But then when we consider, let's say, serious decision making regarding complex matters in the world, uh, both the intuitive system and the rational language-based system are important and they collaborate in us at best. And uh, Professor Ab uh, Abdikste, who is from Netherlands, has been explaining and going through empirically these things very carefully. So these two systems are actually operating uh, in collaboration and intuition is something else than emotions. That's to be, for example, one important thing to be remembered. We have memory systems, very short-term memory and long-term conceptual memory and so on, and different kinds of memories. For example, I have, because of my disease, I have lost my memory for names mostly, so I remember a number of names, but for example, when you introduce yourself, I have to be apologetic for the fact that I don't then remember your name because it requires me to hear the name for about 20 times. But I recognize you as concepts when we discuss and, and so on. So we have different memory systems. And then uh, we are embodied, which is in cognitive science and cognitive linguistics important uh, aspect. So we are in the world. And that's why some people are very enthusiastic about robotics, because then we have computational systems which are grounded a little bit deeper through experience in the world. But still, that's quite early thing and mostly as a part of AI, robotics is still minute in comparison with all the things of dealing with the data that we have about the world. And as humans, we have this, uh, from cognitive science point of view, we have this uh, perception action loop. And we humans are really wonderful as performing as true perception because what logicians and philosophers and so on over the thousands of years, they have had one really severe problem. If we think about what happens here when I look at you and you are looking here and around, the process of seeing the world around and touching and so on is something where the complexities are much beyond the complexities and what is available through, for example, language and logic. 
So naming something is that the, giving the name for something is really the end result of a very complex process. And how we create our linguistic and conceptual system is such a system that hasn't been available for the earlier philosophers because they haven't had the computational means to model the processes, especially emergence. So that what happens when we have millions of something and that gives rise to smaller number of something like the words and their meanings that we are dealing with in here. And we have a, such a variety, for example, among ourselves, including professions, so that we are efficient in the world because we are different. We can do different things. And through that kind of division of labor, we are much more uh, efficient and successful than we would be if we would all understand and have the skills related to the same things. And that has been one of the key factors regarding the uh, success of humans over the uh, hundreds and thousands of years. And currently, we have really a great variety of skills. And of course, this relates then the, the de developments of AI and all these discussions these years that which professions will be remaining and which will be kind of fading away because machines will be taking over. But of course, we have the variety of uh, skills and then skills, but also values and identities and personalities and all kinds of things. So uh, one of the problems is that because we have limited possibility to model the world, we have huge brain and cognitive capacity, especially in relation to the written and symbolic culture and so on. Because we are not alone here, but we are together with you and each of us, and we are with all the earlier generations who have been writing things and so on. So the understanding, the culture and science have been built uh, over, over the long times, and it's of course relying on the linguistic representation, symbolic representation. But uh, this is a kind of interplay or play uh, between our cognitive capacity, which is such that it means that we can't exchange our brains with each other. So we have to use this narrow channel, channel, uh, channel of language. And within our brain, there are very many things that take place consciously and unconsciously. And that's why actually the modeling of neural networks and other forms of statistical machine learning that wouldn't be then uh, built on symbolic representation are important because then we have a kind of model of ourselves as intuitive uh, systems, not only as and language-based reasoning systems. Because the complexity of the world is such that we can't really handle with it only through language and these kind of logical rules. My favorite topic uh, and that I have been uh, doing research on the most is related to linguistics and language processing. And there is this problem that if you are within humanities, some things are really obvious. And if you are within natural language processing, those things start to be much less obvious because one starts to see the world from the lenses of computer science. And computer science, it's still, I dare to say, in its infancy in relation to the needs of humanities and social sciences. And one of those facts, so to say. That's not my favorite word, because fact is a very uh, complicated thing to consider very care carefully and philosophically. But let's say the fact is anyway that the words that we have are such that we deal with them in a different way. 
And then regarding identity, which I'm referring to through this poem that I wrote when I started at the University of Art and Design for a couple of years, there I wanted to point out that the identity and model of the other people is often so narrow that we just take a word or two and then we think that we understand the other person just through that uh, short description. But of course people are not just that we are so much vaster. So the vectorial representation is much better than linguistic representation alone. So that the fact, concept of fact is quite problematic. It's very important, as we know from modern or this current societal po point of view, but still, if we say that this is a fact or that's not a fact, so there are complexities and complications that we need to take into account. And uh, in AI, it was a very early idea already that representing the world and reasoning about the world are central tasks. And then the question is that do we represent and reason over the world in such a way that we think only through language and logic or do we have, have some other means? And this good old fashioned AI, I put the G into uh, parentheses because I find it not so good because what we have now available is something better in, in a very substantial way because the complexity and the pattern-like uh, nature of the world can be dealt with in uh, new ways. But anyway, so the current means, whether they are multi-layer perceptions or all kinds of uh, methodologies related to, for example, pattern recognition, they are very important and the we come then, we are kind of here coming to the discussion that is relevant or is going on and you are uh, experts uh, here in very, very different ways into uh, the idea of how data is used and what is actually the uh, role of data. And nowadays we have more and more natural data or such a data which is not processed in such a way that the interpretation would be there very clearly available. And there, one key idea and important thing is that the data is in a context. So that the meaning of something is actually being decided or determined by the context where the data comes from. And that's why that's one of the things is that in order to uh, bring understanding into the things is not to define formally that this is now a number, a value of something which is, has this specific semantic kind of context, but actually the thing is that the data needs to be in the context of other pieces of data. For example, yesterday there were very good discussions related to the, this kind of contextuality. Uh, if we think about the ethics of AI, so uh, transparency and accountability are important things that have been discussed here. But then the problem also is that the if we think about what do we really understand, what can we represent in a truthful way, that's actually in some sense impossible. So we can't really be accurate in a, let's say, a logical way because the uh, infinite complexity of the world makes us to be always a bit behind of the world. And that's something that we need to also take into account. I take even a dramatic uh, idea there that when we try to represent the world, we often come up with a way of formalizing, finding a form that is actually violence towards people. When we put people into categories, when we categorize, describe the world, that's something where we 
kind of make a distinction between the true thing and then the formalized thing. And it depends on the kind of luck of the person, whether he or she is close to that formalized system and its kind of framework, or whether there's some discrepancy. And that can be, have a dramatic con uh, influence on that person in the society, what happens. And that's why when we formalize our rules and, and uh, principles that we deal with in the world, so we have to be very careful. And there, that's why I would uh, dare to suggest that uh, law and legal systems are in the advent of some kind of future uh, possibilities to make people uh, and persons to have a better future. When, especially when people are somehow unusual in the sense that they are not fitting into categories that have been imposed on us. Uh, and that's why the explanation what these, let's say, multilayer neural networks they can't explain, or they can't, strictly speaking, explain why they make, so to say, some decisions. But the same thing is true for us regarding complex uh, things. Our brains are such complex systems that we can't understand ourselves either. We can have processes to try to have some uh, linguistic representations that explain what we have come up with. But anyway, the neural processes, the complex processes are such that we are really not, can't be aware what was the exact uh, kind of network process that came up with this, with the all past memories and so on, often influencing the system. That's why we have to be quite careful about aiming at having a, let's say, true explanation. But that doesn't, of course, mean that we shouldn't aim at being clear about what are the basic lines. But I would just want to kind of point out that this kind of logical thinking doesn't really, it's not at all enough, because that doesn't really cover the world, just a small box. And there's huge thing around it, including subjectivity so that the systems are really subject, uh, subjective. And the way how we go through the life, uh, through past, and we are in the present and in the future, uh, in the concept of peace machine, that's not the idea of predicting the future. We have intentionality. We humans can make decisions and we can want to, uh, we can uh, have uh, wishes about the future and so on, and we can agree to do things. And that's why it's not only just that, okay, AI is something and it comes like some nature force and does some things to us, but we can have intentions on the use of AI. And that's something which I want to stress. Of course, the directors of Google or Facebook or whatever, they have much more power in influencing our future. But the idea of having some AI systems to do things with themselves and do, start to do things that are then bad for us, it is an interesting discussion. But I was doing those things already 30 years ago. It was a fun type of play to do thing, uh, systems that are kind of building things by themselves and programming new versions of themselves and so on. These kind of uh, genetic algorithms and uh, this kind of genetic programming have been there for decades and it's nothing new. Of course, the capacity is coming up now, but anyway, even those systems are mostly being used and can be used to serve some purposes that we humans have. And then the question is that for which purposes we use this and who decides what we do. And that's why in the title this, I would say, not only my AI, 
and my AI experiences that I'm also kind of uh, presenting to you, but it's about our AI. What do we want and what do we need to do with the AI? And that's why it's a societal question, it's a democracy question, that how do we apply the possibilities that are there, whether it's uh, poverty or, or uh, diseases or all kinds of things related to environment and so on. So the uh, 1,600 uh, billion dollars that are being used for for fighting and preparing to have wars is, of course, waste of money, and they should be used to these much better purposes. But it hasn't been very realistic to think about that there could be some kind of peace in the world. But the idea that I got about two years ago, and I thought first, okay, world peace is not possible, but then when I opened the door, I realized that there are dozens and dozens of possibilities that the AI in its different forms, in the modern AI, has regarding this particular question, for example, among the understanding among humans. And there is this interesting question that there is a lot of discussion nowadays and important discussion related learning from data and then the, we have the intentionality. So garbage in, garbage out has been there for a very long time, and that's still true. But then the question that how do we combine this idea that we can learn from data with some thoughts that we can have a direction, we can have goals, we can have intentionality. And data is in some sense experience. So the computational model having some data, it kind of has an analogical position as our experience. And then if we think about what is there, we have uh, di uh, direct experience of the world, but much of our understanding is based on indirect experience and often then being formalized in the form of language linguistic expressions, whether they are more like logical statements, but most of a little bit kind of softer ways of using language. And that's, that's a very important process, where we are nowadays in a situation that the still maturity of AI research and work is focused on dealing with numerical data numbers rather than words. And that's why the question of using words in such a way that we humans use language is still not quite there. And I would say that there is still work to be done regarding computational uh, modeling of language concepts and so on, the systems there. But it's getting kind of closer to that, that might be then uh, let's say, pragmatically and practically useful uh, at the level of humans. Still nowadays, qualitative research is important in the sense that the human understanding of qualities and the way how things relate to context and human culture and experience is uh, hugely much uh, more uh, or better than the computational models are. But there is a development within this where the uh, quantity is becoming a quality when there is enough of the contextual data and, and so on, both history in the uh, timeline and then the width of the things in the world. And the methods that we have are, many people are aware of these, but anyway, I want to repeat still about the idea of supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Where supervised learning is my, uh, personally I have been not very happy about supervised learning because it's a way of dealing with the world that includes our categories and our thoughts about the world, how we think it is 
but it's never in a way truthful because we need to be able to go outside of the box. And always when we have categories involved, that's the box. And that's why unsupervised learning is much more powerful in that sense to have a view into the world, which I have here called somehow some uh, like of Buddhist AI, so that we can deal with the world without the categories which we impose into data. Reinforcement is important from the point of view that we can have values and intentions, and then the question is that how do we, we uh, deal with that? And that's why the use of AI is actually, if we think about the society, the use of AI needs to be this kind of interplay between ourselves and the systems to be used at different levels of abstraction. So that this is not enough to consider these things at one level of reality, but there are multiple levels of reality that we need to deal with, starting from, let's say, very concrete measurements about what is happening in the world, even in the environment and so on, and then going into our human values and even religions and use of language and concepts and so on. And that's why, for example, the idea of emergence is important. So that to deal with the complexity, we humans have quite strong emergence capacities in our brain. So the things that emerge in our brain are such that they have this emergence as a basic ingredient, even if we are not very aware of that. And that's something where I, for example, those of you who uh, are aware of the computer science idea and Berners-Lee work where he has tried to kind of create the model of the world and devise this kind of semantic description of the world, the word ontology is misused there very uh, badly because if we at least take the traditional philosophy and the point of view, ontology means in essence the world. And this kind of semantic descriptions and use of word, that's at least not the world in its all complexity, but that's the description of the world which belongs to the area of epistemology. And that's to be pointed out. Uh, so there are generative processes that makes uh, numbers and words to be available to us. For example, in regarding language, a language is not the system that would have been in a way given to us, but it's really a dynamical system that is all the time in evolutionary process is kind of taking place around it especially if we consider semantics, pragmatics, meaning, uh, meanings of, of words and expressions. So when we are having uh, this situation of dealing with the complexities of the world, the understanding of the world is something that needs to be taken seriously into account and uh, how we, the intentionality of what we want to reach is, is needed. And that's why when we are using AI technologies, it's very much a democratic process, or it should be, not a business of some uh, leaders of companies or, or the political leaders only, but really uh, all of us. And that's why we are having a situation that we need to deal with machine learning and other forms of AI in a very serious way, pointing uh, towards ethics and society in such a way that that comes into us in a, in a, uh, taking that into a very uh, serious way. Here I just uh, have in this slide, first of all, some uh, uh, commenting this um, question of different forms of machine learning, but uh, the 
question about how to consider this deep learning is very current situation, but the basic idea there that the system gives rise emergently a model of the reality in such a way that the different levels of the representation emerge in a way by themselves from the data. So we don't need to decide upon that what are the levels of the representation, but the data gives rise to that emergence. And if we think about uh, meaning, so if we think about a word like white, we think that, okay, white is a clear thing. But if you are in Finnish nature playing golf there in the winter, so if you think about the logician's uh, statement that uh, snow is white if and only if snow is white. Okay, but for us, snow is typically not white in our perception. It's a kind of illusion that the projection of the whiteness in our perception would be the exact white. It can be even quite close to black. So we are dealing with these very complex processes where our uses and definitions of ling uh, linguistic components and the concepts are very much simplifications. And the reality and the complexity of the communication and understanding the world is huge, even in these kind of very basic things. So what is, if we think about the word beautiful or computational or democratic or fair, those are very far from obvious, or it's actually obvious that we understand and have a different meaning for words like fair. And even computational, there was uh, some five, ten years ago, there was a workshop on computation. And for two years, uh, sorry, for two days, the people there were not fighting, but seriously discussing what does computation mean. There were computer scientists, philosophers, and so on. And there was no outcome that this is computation. Even such a very formal and clear-cut, in some sense, word is not clear for people who then start to seriously think about what is that. That means that we can't really have an Esperanto of meaning. We have to have a something which is then thought that we can have a machine cons considering the differences in meaning. We can have the chance to build uh, systems that guide us to have uh, meetings among huge numbers of people to consider really the me uh, content, not only the end result of some categories. We can deal with uh, our emotional world in such a way that we can have wise guides that are helping us to deal with our fears, our whatever emotions, and to make us to be more peaceful and more kind of relaxed, for example, within social situations. And they can be the mobile phones, for example, in the future that could be there. And I would uh, underline the idea of freedom here, so that they don't need to be given by some big brother, but really something that there are tools that help us to live our lives in a more relaxed and happy way. And if I think about openness, so I start to conclude by giving the idea here that the reason why I'm here and why I got the idea of the peace machine is actually thanks to my brain cancer. So uh, some four years ago, I was diagnosed with brain cancer because I started to lose my vision and then it was uh, checked and there was a big part of my brain that was uh, being kind of affected by a tumor and it was operated, but bad luck was that it was the worst possible category, but I'm not dead yet, and I actually thought that, okay, let's try to live anyway. So this is now the situation, and thanks to this uh, experience, I've been actually much more, I've been much happier and much more effective than I was before that. 
But I don't suggest that people should have a brain cancer to become happy. But anyway, so that's, that's the situation I had. And that's why uh, I was also able to come up with the idea that if I have a 30 years of experience on de developing and using AI, so what could it be used for? And maybe world peace. And now I have, through the feedback I have got and all the work here, so it seems to me that the community that we have is one of the emergent outcomes is actually that in some hundred years from now, we have much better world through the fact that we can be much more peaceful. And uh, my problem is there that this part of the brain has gone, but as said so, that's not such a big thing. I don't need to drive the car, but I'm just eagerly waiting for the robotic cars to be there so that we can say that can we drive there or whatever. And as, as I said, so I have been very pleased and happy about the fact that there's a certain need for a more peaceful world. We are wasting huge sums of money into just very negative things. So I would dare to say that most of the people, if they ask that, do you want to have a peace or do you want to have a war? So it's a huge uh, win for the uh, peace. But still, it has been quite realistic thought that we need all those defense forces because there are those people who we can't trust. And that takes that 100 years before we really can build the trust. But the striking things, thing to me is that actually the technology of artificial intelligence, all these modern forms, can be the key factor, like printing changed the world some 50 years, uh, 500 years ago, and so on. So it's the uh, kind of net outcome is then to be taken into account. There are many processes that are taking place related to the peace machine concept. Uh, book was in Finnish, but now it's being translated into English and hopefully into Chinese and Russian and many other languages. A little bit Ch uh, Japanese is already there. And then, uh, as a uh, final comment in Finnish here, the meeting will be in Finnish, but 19th of September, there will be a meeting on where this uh, society will be uh, created in order to take this further thing further. Because I really don't know if I live for a month <clears throat> or a year or 10 years or whatever, but anyway, this is not a uh, thing for one person to do. Of course, this is something which I hope that there will be things and also implicit I impact of many things that this community and scientific community and so on do is actually taking this thing further in an implicit way. So thank you very much for your attention and I would be very happy to have a discussion if I didn't use all the time for, for that, but anyway, and for the future, so please contact in some way or another. I'm quite uh, slow in reading, and that's why emails are not that efficient. So I rather uh, like to meet people uh, in face to face or some other way that the spoken communication is the primary, primary way to have a conversation with me. But thank you very much.